Okay, so in the last video, we talked about convolution examples, showed a bunch of convolution examples. And in this video, we're going to talk about convolution properties, okay, properties of the convolution operation. So what is the convolution operation? Well, we write it as f of t convolved with g of t. Okay, and it gives us a new function of time, a new signal. And that signal is given by this integral. And as we saw, or maybe we didn't see it, but you can show it for yourself very easily with a change of variables, okay, that this integral, it doesn't matter uh, whether you put the tau and the t minus tau with f and g or vice versa. Okay, so I can write this integral as f of t minus tau times g of tau d tau, and you can show that on your own just with a change of variables. It's not too hard. So either of these integrals is perfectly good. When I'm actually computing the convolution, I often like to put t minus tau, the more complicated argument with the simpler function. So if g was sort of a simpler function, easier function, I would use t minus tau for that function and put the simpler argument tau with the maybe more complicated function f, whatever it is. Um, so you can try that for yourself too, but whether you use either of these integrals, you get the same answer. Okay, and what is the convolution? Well, if you look, all we're doing is integrating the function f, but each value f of tau is going to be multiplied by the function g of t minus tau. So you can think of this g of t minus tau as sort of providing weights, sort of a weighting function. Okay, so this f of tau value, whatever it is, this g function can apply a weight to that function when we compute the integral. So we saw that in the last video, and that's what convolution is doing. <laughs> it's just integrating our function f, but multiplied by the weights given by g of t minus tau. And as t increases, this function is going to, as we saw, kind of shift across the function f, applying those weights at every instance, at every point in time t. And we keep computing this integral of f of tau times the weights given by g of t minus tau, adding it all up. And that is our convolution, OK? So it's just integrating the function f with some weights applied to that integral, the values that we're integrating. OK, so that's convolution. And here's some properties. So the first one is that it's commutative. What does that mean? <coughs> well, that just means that f of t and g of t, when I convolve them, it's the same as g of t convolved with f of t. And I'm not going to prove these operations or these uh, properties formally. All of them follow very quickly from these equations. So you can think about that maybe on your own but it's not too bad. Uh, the next one is associativity. So convolution is associative. What does that mean? That means that f of t convolved with g of t convolved with some other function h of t. Okay, I'm just using h as a general function. I don't necessarily mean to say the impulse response here. We haven't talked about LTI systems at all here. Just three general functions, f, g, and h. And that's the same as if I first convolved f and g and then convolve that result with h of t. So we can move the parentheses around however we want, and we get the same answer. Next one is that the, the convolution function is distributive. OK, what does that mean? That means if I have f of t convolved with g of t plus some other function h of t, then I can distribute that convolution through. This one is very useful. OK, so these three properties, you can see that it kind of the convolution operation, while it is absolutely not multiplication, right? This is not multiplication. It's doing something very different than multiplication. At least these three properties sort of work how multiplication would work, right? We know multiplication is commutative. We know multiplication is associative. And we, knew, we know multiplication distributes through addition. OK, so convolution is not multiplication, not at all. Okay, but these three properties it does have in common with multiplication. All right, how about the next one? What happens if we shift? What happens if we time shift one of the functions? So let me just write if y of t is going to be f of t convolved with g of t. The question is, what happens when I do f of t minus tau convolved with g of t? How does that affect this convolution that I got before, this y of t? Well, it turns out that it's the same as if I did f of t convolved with g of t minus tau. And what you might be hoping for is true. 
This is just y of t minus tau. Okay, so if I shift either function, then it just ends up shifting the same convolution function I got before, y of t, by that amount. So that's what this property says. And this also shows, this is a common question people always have, what happens if I shift both of the functions? f of t minus t1 convolved with g of t minus t2. What do I get then? Well, you can just apply this property twice. First, you get that it's y shifted by t1, and then again, y shifted by t2, that result. So it's just y of t minus t1 minus t2. Okay, just apply that property twice. Okay, so that's the shifting property, time shift property. And we can also look at what happens if I differentiate. Okay, so again, I'll call the function y of t, f of t convolved with g of t. Okay, then what happens if I take the derivative f prime of t involved with g of t? Turns out that's the same as f of t involved with g prime of t, and that's the same as just differentiating the result y. And sort of, again, we can double this up and say this also shows if I have f prime of t involved with g prime of t, then I just apply this property twice and I get the double derivative of y. Okay, so these are five useful properties of convolution that we'll be using throughout the class, okay, in various places, and they're also helpful from sol for solving problems. So let's see some examples. So let's recall, this is from a previous video, I think maybe even the previous video. <coughs> we looked at the convolution, okay, of this square with itself. These are functions of time. Okay, I'll call this f of t and g of t. And we saw that that convolution gave us this triangle. Okay, we did this one out by hand. Zero, one, two. And I'll just call this y of t. <coughs> this is height one. Okay, so this is in a previous video. Now I'm going to manipulate f and g and we'll try and see what the output should be. Okay, so what happens if I take f and I shift it to the right? This is f of t minus one. I'm going to convolve that with g of t. Is that height one? And what would I get? Well, you don't want to go through and do this entire convolution again. We already did all that work. We can just use a property. It's the time shift property. Okay, so I shifted f of t minus one. I'm convolving it with g of t. So what should I get? I should get y of t minus one. And that's it. Very simple. Okay, so I just have to shift my triangle function to the right by the same amount. Okay, so you can see these properties are very useful. They can save a lot of time. You wouldn't want to have to do that whole convolution again when the answer is so simple and you can get it from properties immediately. All right, now let's do another one. What happens if I keep my F shifted? But then I shift my G function the other way. G of T plus one. What happens then? As the convolution change, well, there are two ways you can look at it. Either you could say, okay, I know what f convolved with g is. Let me apply the time shift property in this double case. <coughs> in which case, what would you get? You get f of t minus one. So this is one. Convolve with g of t plus one. So that t2 is negative one. Minus minus one is plus one. So over here, you get y of t minus one. Minus minus one, so plus one. So they cancel and you just get y of t. Just get y of t. Both of those time shifts sort of cancel each other out. Alternatively, you could say, oh, well, I just found what f of t minus one convolved with g of t was. It was y of t minus one. So now I'm just taking that result and time shifting g plus one. So I just add plus one to this time shift. And again, I get y of t. They're really doing the same thing, but maybe two slightly different ways of looking at it. And so we get back our original function y of t.
Okay. All right, let's do another one. So what happens if I wanted to compute the convolution now of this function? Okay, so I've lengthened f, and I want to convolve that with g of t. You know, make it more to scale, something like that. So this is g of t. What is that convolution? Well, is there any way I can express this function maybe in terms of f? Well, I think so, because, right, it's just this f of t plus this f of t minus 1. If I just add those two squares, they join together, and I get this function. Right? So this is just f of t plus f of t minus 1. Okay, and so when I do this convolution, what should I get? I'll just do it out quickly below. So f of t involved with, or sorry, f of t plus f of t minus 1 involved with g of t. What property can we use? We have a sum convolved with another function, the distributive property. Okay, so I get f of t convolved with g of t plus f of t minus one convolved with g of t minus, or g of t, sorry. And so this is just my y of t plus, and now the time shift property, y of t minus one. That's it. So my answer should be y of t plus y of t minus one. What does that look like? Well, we have them both right here, so we just have to add them up. So between 0 and 1, I'm just going to get this function. <coughs> what about between 1 and 2? Well, all I'm doing is <coughs> adding these two triangles. Okay, so you can kind of imagine it, just putting this triangle up here when I add those functions. And so I'm just going to get that constant line 1. Of course, you could write out the explicit equations, and you'll still see you get constant line 1. Okay, that's just kind of a faster way, just visually. And then between two and three, I just have this down, this come down. <coughs> so I just added those two functions, and that's what I get. Okay, so these properties can really get you far. You can get convolutions of a lot of new functions. Let's do one more. Okay, I'm going to start with my f of t. And now I want to look at the derivative, g prime of t. What is that? Well, as we saw when we took the derivative of the unit step function, right, what's the derivative of this part? It should just be a delta function with height or area one. And then down here, I'm coming down by an amount of one. So it should be a negative delta function with area negative one. Okay, the other way you can see that is just to say, what is g of t? Well, it's just the unit step function. But then I want to make that unit step function go back to zero at one. So I just subtract from it u of t minus one. And so if I take the derivative of that, what do I get? I get the derivative of this, which is delta. We saw that in a previous video. Derivative of the unit step function is delta minus the derivative of u of t minus one. Well, that's just delta of t minus one, right? The derivative of a time shifted version of a function. It's just the time shifted version of that derivative. Okay. <coughs> so this is what we get. The first way was sort of just using what we know. The second way was more explicit, but we get the same thing. And so what is this convolution? Okay. Well, we can compute this two ways and check the answer. <coughs> first of all, let's do it using the property. Using the properties, this should just be y prime of t, right? Derivative property f of t convolved with g prime of t gives me y prime of t. And so all I have to do is take the derivative. I just have to take the derivative of this y function. The slope here is 1. And the slope here is negative 1. Now, give myself more room. So the slope here is 1. And the slope there is negative 1. So that's the derivative of y. Okay, but we can also check this using another property. This is just f of t convolved with g prime of t. Is f of t convolved with delta of t <coughs> minus delta of t minus 1. That's what we just showed. But that's what g prime of t was. And now we can use the distributive property. This is f of t convolved with delta minus f of t convolved with delta of t minus 1. And in the last video, we saw that when you convolve with delta, you just get back the same function with any shifts in the delta applied to it. 
So f of t convolved with delta of t is just f of t. There are no shifts minus f of t minus one, right? Applying that t minus one shift to f. And sure enough, f of t is this function. And I'm going to subtract from it this function, but negate it and shift it to the right by one. Or sorry, I'm going to subtract that function. I'm going to add that function negated. I'm going to subtract this function, but shifted to the right by one. And sure enough, that's that part right there. Okay, so these two are equal, which is what we want. Okay, so two methods to get this answer here. All right, now let's shift gears to a slightly different final example, just something that does come up sometimes. What if I have two functions that just have deltas in them? Okay, let's say this is my f of t now. And let's say I want to convolve that with another function that just has deltas. <coughs> Maybe this one is height 2, not 1. Let's say this is my g of t. Okay, and I want to convolve these two functions. What can I do? Okay, well, there are multiple ways I could write out all these delta functions and use convolution properties and get a bunch of terms, but we have it already drawn here. Let's try and maybe do it slightly more graphically, but I'll write it algebraically first. Let's just take this f of t function and convolve it with these two deltas. So this is equal to f of t involved with negative delta of t plus one. That's this delta function plus two delta of t minus one. That's that one. Okay, and we know from all of this talk up here that when I convolve with a delta, I just shift f by the amount the delta shifted. So I get negative f of t plus 1 plus 2 f of t minus 1. Okay, so let's just draw both of those functions. Negative f of t plus 1, that's just taking this function and convolving it here. So what, what happens graphically is that we take this function and we shift it so that it's centered on this delta point. Right? That's what this function shift is doing. So it shifted on, or it shifted so that it's centered on negative one now, because that's what that delta is. And then we apply the scaling factor, negative one. So what does that function look like? Negative f of t plus one. Well, I'm just going to take this, shift it to the left by one, and multiply by negative one. So I'm going to get these two delta functions, both at negative one. Their area negative one. This is centered at negative two and zero. <coughs> just took this, shifted it to the left, and negated it. Okay, that is f of, sorry, t plus 1. All right, now I want to add to that this next function, where I take the function shifted to the right by 1 and multiply by 2. I'm going to take this shifted to the right by 1, so I'm going to get two deltas at 0 and 2. And I scaled it by 2, so that now both of these heights are 2. And this is 2 f of t minus 1. So now let's add them. Okay, so I did that plus this. Now let's add them. What do I get? This function plus zero gives me that same function. Now I have negative delta plus two delta. That just leaves me with a single delta left. And then over here, I have two delta plus nothing. That leaves me with a single delta of height two. Yeah. <coughs> okay, this is my answer, and I can even write it out algebraically. Negative delta of t plus 2 plus delta of t plus 2 delta of t minus 2. Okay, so that's how you can convolve two functions that just have deltas in them. And for practice, you could try writing out f of t and g of t, right? We already wrote out g of t, but you could write out f of t as well and just use convolution properties and manipulate all the deltas without drawing any pictures and you get the same answer but I think drawing pictures kind of makes it make more sense and is easier to do okay so great so that was a bunch of examples using the convolution properties and that's all I have for this video I will see you in the next one